Hello and welcome to the Hard Report. Today I'm joined by Stuart Milk, LGBT rights activist in his own right. You're the nephew of Harvey Milk, the first openly gay person elected to public office in California. You're the co-founder of the Harvey Milk Foundation and have worked across the world and accepted the Presidential Medal of Freedom on behalf of your uncle. Stuart, thank you for joining me. Great to be here. Let's begin with receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom. How does it feel to have your uncle's legacy honored like that? There's a backstory to it, so I'll tell you that, you know, that also impacted us creating Harvey Milk Day. Um, we had, uh, uh, the year before, uh, we worked out with the White House, my uncle, to receive the, the Medal of Freedom. Uh, we had passed legislation in California creating a bank holiday for Harvey, and that was vetoed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, so, um, you know, the Terminator. We call him the governor. Um, he was a Republican, and uh, he his veto message was that Harvey was important, but important to San Francisco and really nowhere else. Mm. And so, um, uh, so in the year between that veto in 2007 and uh, um, and the following year, we had not only the Presidential Medal of Freedom awarded to Harvey, but he was inducted into the California Hall of Fame. And the Sean Penn movie, Milk, came out, and uh, Sean won the Academy Award for Best Actor. Um, and we had uh, uh, moved forward on uh, naming uh, some more schools after Harvey that were outside of California. So uh, the White House message on Harvey was that Harvey Milk was an inspiration uh, through his courage and through his um, vision to not only LGBT people but to everyone and the president's message was to, across the world that he impacted literally tons of millions of people and so um, it was really much a counter message to Arnold's well Harvey was important but only to San Francisco so it was really more than anything it was that Medal of Freedom and the White House message that um, we then convinced Arnold, with some help with a woman named Maria Shriver, who's his wife, um, to uh, sign the bill and create a, a bank holiday that now every Californian celebrates Harvey Milk Day, May 22nd. Every school teaches about Harvey. So it's by law, you must teach about Harvey Milk the week of May 22nd. Um, and some people say, well, it's only one state but it's twice the size of Australia, uh, population-wise. One out of every eight Americans lives in California, so for, you know, it's pretty significant that we have um, now a holiday celebrating Harvey and his important message. Do you think Harvey was always political by instinct? Well, he comes from a family that, that was active, and so um, uh, Morris Milk, who was my grandfather, my great-grandfather, I'm sorry, um, uh, Morris, who was Harvey's grandfather, um, he, you know, he told Harvey a story that Harvey told me and my brother. It was interesting, my father didn't tell us the story, but Harvey would be told by his grandfather, you know, don't hide your green hair, they can see it anyway. Um, as a young kid, and he would be, you know, he would say to us, well, I don't have green hair, what are you talking about? And he would go on to talk about authenticity. And so, uh, of course, he wasn't, Morris wasn't talking about gay people, but he was talking about just being who you are and don't hiding that from the world. So he kind of, you know, that was in his blood. Um, there was a uh, department store that uh, Harvey uh, worked in, which was his grandfather's um, milks department store in Woodmere, New York, where uh, Morris would bring communi different communities of faith together. Uh, it was finally a burned down because of that activity. So there is this, you know, trajectory that Harvey had. Uh, he, of course, ran for politics both in, in, in his high school, Bayshore High School, and he had a, um, he went to Albany Teachers College, which is now the State University of New York at Albany, and they did a big celebration for, uh, for his recognition, but they brought out all this student writing that he did. So his column was actually shut down in college because he was questioning why ROTCs were on campus and why they're teaching teachers about war and so his column was shut down and then he reinvented it and came back again so yeah he has a trajectory of being outspoken and, and, and uh, you know both in his family history growing up and also in his uh, history as a young man. What was it like having such an outspoken LGBT rights activist as an uncle at a time when it wasn't acceptable to be gay, let alone be campaigning for LGBT rights. Yeah, it was. It was the best. The best of both. It was the best and worst of times. So, um, you know, 
as a uh, teenager who was gay myself, um, uh, and you have to realize when Harvey ran for public office, it was illegal to be LGBT when he began running, and it was considered a mental illness by the American Psychiatric and Psychological Association. So, you know, for me as a young kid, um, knowing that I was gay in school, you know, having I mean, the New York Times have on the cover avowed homosexual, that's the way they would describe uh, Harvey, avowed homosexual runs again. Um, you know, for his campaigns. It was really, you know, it would be the front page and milk is not a common name. So, you know, in school people would be like, you know, are you like your uncle? And uh, so it was uncomfortable for me, but, for, but on a personal level I wouldn't have given that up even then because Harvey was my touchstone to my own authenticity. And you know, he has gone back and went back to San Francisco and told everyone that I was gay, but he never talked about that with me. He only talked about why it was important for me to be authentic. He would tell me stories like of, of my great grandfather, his grandfather with the green hair. Um, but he would give me, you know, he even gave me a book of Native American traditions. Um, uh, and in the cover, he wrote, You and all your differences is the medicine that will heal the world, even when the world doesn't recognize that. Um, he would call me um, from California when I was in junior high school and say, you know, hey, what happened today that you felt different from everyone? And I'm like, oh my God, you know, that's the last thing I want to think about. But he thought it was exciting. He thought it was great. He said, people don't realize the people who are different are, are the people who are going to move the world forward. So embrace that. We, we touched on it a little bit at the start of the interview, but what do you see as Harvey's legacy? Well, his legacy is, is really all the kids that have kitchen table conversations that to this day are uncomfortable. Um, who his story, his message, and those that have come out um, publicly have allowed those conversations to be a little bit easier. But they're never easy. I mean, we see even in the most supportive cities, the most supportive environments, telling, you know, for a kid to tell their parents that they think they're gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender is still difficult. And he wanted them to be embraced. He wanted them to be supported. He, he knew that this was a, a movement that requires vigilance, that it doesn't end one day, and that we're, you know, you know he, he believed that it, this is a constant process. He used to tell me that if everyone, every LGBT person turned purple overnight, we would have no problems. Because we would be in every church, we'd be in every economic group, we'd be in every culture, um, and we'd be visible. And people would support us because we were known and all the lies and myths and innuendos about us would be gone. But we don't turn purple, and we don't turn pink, or, or rainbow colored, or whatever. And so this coming out process, um, and you know, and, and acknowledging that you are not part of the majority, that you have a, a lifestyle, a love of a, of of a, a potential uh, partners that is different than the majority, is a, is a difficult process to this day. And so I think he, the thing that he would be most inspired by is that his story is allowing those conversations to happen. It's supporting kids on school grounds and in kitchen table conversations and it's supporting people who feel that they don't belong. You co-founded the Harvey Milk Foundation. Could you tell us a bit about the work of the organization for those that might not be familiar with sure. it? Sure, we go to wherever um, there is our work is global, and I think Harvey um, uh, certainly would have believed that it's important that we do global work. And so um, the, his belief was that wherever there's a young person who is struggling with being accepted, then we must reach out to them, that we are, none of us are free until all of us are free. So we do global work. Um, we do work around his legacy. We um, usually go to the places that no one else will go. So it was great recording that if your, your viewers ever um, watch, uh, if they Google Harvey Milk and Juana, it's his last TV uh, show that he did. And um, uh, on that uh, TV show, um, Juana began with, you know, well, we couldn't get this person, Harvey, and we couldn't get this person, so we ended up with you. And, and, and he was like, yeah, you couldn't get anyone else, so you ended up with me. Let's talk about the issues. And we usually, when we do global work, they've reached out to everyone, they've come up with a dead end, and they reach out to us. So we like that, that symmetry between, you know, Harvey's story and, and ours. Why do you think his story still resonates so much with people to this day? Well, I mean, I think it's again goes back to that 
the element of sacrifice. I mean, Harvey, we, and Cronenberg, who was his campaign manager, I still have copies of all of the death threats he got. They, most of them were actually not anonymous. They were signed. There was an Orange County sheriff who said, you know, Harvey, you step a foot in Orange County and my deputies will put bullets in your head. I mean, so he didn't know it would be Dan White, but he definitely knew someone was going to kill him. And, um, and so, um, you know, that that message of let the bullets that smash through my brain smash through every closet door, people around the world hear that and say, you know, this guy took these bullets for me. I should be authentic. I should come out. I should be unmasked. Harvey had something to do with the rainbow flag becoming a big symbol of the LGBT community. Yes, yeah, so, well, Gilbert Baker, who, uh, who is the, the, the creator of the rainbow flag, Harvey said to him, we need a rainbow flag. I mean, we need a, I'm sorry, <laughs> we need a flag for the LGBT community that should show our diversity. And so Gilbert came up with the rainbow flag. He also was the one who called for it. So a year after Harvey was killed, we had a national march, the first ever for LGBT rights in Washington, DC in 1979. I was there with my boyfriend, um, who I had come out and already got into a relationship. But um, uh, that was also a call that Harvey had made. He said, we need a national march and the leaders of of the LGBT movement at the time, we're like, no, we're not going to be, we're not going to do something that's too in your face. And so, you know, his assassination, which, and then the second bullets, we call them the second bullets in the family, which was the verdict. Um, so the second important historical trajectory of my uncle was that you had this verdict that said that basic, I, mean, I was in the courtroom when, when the confession of Dan White was played. And he said, you know, I'm a good Catholic, former policeman, former fireman, and I killed a gay man. And now I'm, my life is ruined. And the jury cried not for my uncle and not for Mayor Moscone, but they cried for Dan. They kept, cried for the person who assassinated him. And so that was the second wake-up call, that there was not justice in the United States. And so the verdict, the, the Dan White's defense attorneys asked that they make him not guilty of first degree murder, not guilty of uh, second degree murder in the first uh, sense, not guilty of second degree murder in the second sense. They came back with all of the, exactly what the defense asked. They said, you know, it's okay that you killed a gay guy. And so that was the second wake up call, um, the second set of bullets that we kind of, and you know, of course, uh, you've seen the documentary, you know that there was a night of of called the Night of Gay Rage, it was called. Most San Francisco, most of their police cars were burned. Um, uh, people were angry, but it was again the second piece. I think somehow Harvey knew that that might even occur, and uh, and to use that as a as a way of of changing. And, and and there was even more support for the LGBT community when people around the world saw and, and around the U.S. saw. Yeah, this guy killed, you know, snuck into City Hall with bullets, and we, and we find him not guilty of first degree murder, and there's something wrong there. And so it was the second wave of a wake up call. LGBT rights have come a, a long way in recent years. What do you see as their most important development? Oh, the most important development was marriage equality. So in 2004, my friend Gavin Newsom, who was mayor of San Francisco, you know, he says, Stuart, I'm going to start marrying people. And I said, well, you can't legally do that. And he said, but young people want it. And so older activists like me who've been working on LGBT rights, you know, we, we still don't to this day have in the United States protection from non-discrimination in employment and in housing on a national level. But we felt we needed to get all these things. We needed to be protected. We needed to be have non-discrimination before we get to marriage equality. Um, and uh, part of it was because older activists like me, we just wanted to be with our partners, at, but not be picked on. We, we, marriage wasn't even in the realm of possibility. But marriage equality puts the request at a different level. So marriage equality is not simply saying, don't discriminate tolerate us. It's saying, oh, we want much more than tolerance. We want to be fully included and celebrated. So really where we are today is because of young people demanding marriage equality, and it goes at the very face of the religious opposition to LGBT rights, that we're not part of what they believe in is God, whatever that may be, or the belief in the family, or the belief in our ability to be fully part of society. And it also ties into Harvey's message of visibility. I mean, you don't 
get invited to a secret marriage or, you know, this is a secret, you know, no pictures, no champagne. I mean, it's a celebration and you're out and you usually, hopefully, will put your same-sex partner's picture uh, on the desk at work. And I mean, it also goes to his issue of we have to be visible. You're not just upholding your uncle's legacy, though you're a passionate LGBT rights activist in your own right. What do you see as the next step in LGBT equality? Well, you know, for, we don't have LGBT uh, rights throughout most of the world. So we see this tremendous movement forward in a lot of the West, um, not all of the West, and we also see some movement backwards in the West. So we do a lot of work in Eastern Europe and Euro-Asia, and I think we have to realize that um, LGBT rights, any type of minority rights, requires vigilance. But we also have, you know, two-thirds of the world's population living where it's either illegal or it's um, societally unacceptable to be LGBT. So everything east of Istanbul, I like to say, is, is unfortunately still dark. Um, India, as you probably know, two years ago, you could be legally LGBT at least and exist. And now they, decriminal they recriminalized it when the Supreme Court ruled that there's nothing unconstitutional about uh, making LGBT people illegal. And so, you know, that's one sixth of the world's population in just that one country. Um, and I think it's important for us to realize that when anyone anywhere in the world from any minority community is not free, then we all are at risk. And so our movement moving ahead is to keep that visibility, to keep supporting those young kids having kitchen cable conversations. Um, you know, one of the issues that we are seeing so clearly, not just in New York and San Francisco, but surprisingly in New York and San Francisco, is that LGBT youth are 20 times more likely to be homeless than non-LGBT youth. So it says there's something going on in the families that either they're not being accepted or they're self-selecting to leave. That's a problem. Uh, and these are communities that are tremendously supportive of LGBT people. There's great role models. We need to do better at making sure that we're coming up with culturally sensitive solutions to how we embrace LGBT people. And uh, when I say culturally sensitive, sensitive solutions, there's not one answer to how do you approach families with potentially LGBT kids. And so global work, vigilance on keeping the work forward, just ask my Hungarian friends about how you can go backwards. Um, so countries can go backwards as well. Um, you know, you've got people like uh, Vladimir Putin, who's more than willing to put us up at the stake for their own political gains, um, as well as Viktor Ubun. Um, and so it's important for us to stay vigilant and, you know, for brilliant people like yourself and shows like yourself to be out there, to be showing us who we are, to be encouraging more role models in sports, in, uh, uh, in uh, celebrities, um, politicians, all walks of life, for people to be visible and to be out. I mean, it took a little bit of time to get um, Mr. Uh, Wolf to come out. Um, uh, 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 leaders of, 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 of political parties, CEOs of companies, everyone who's LGBT must be visible. You know, there's, there's the one thing that I would say we should not do, and there are sometimes some people who will say, wouldn't it be great if sometime it doesn't matter and no one says who they are and there are no labels? That's not supportive of that young kid. They need those labels. They need those role models. They need to feel that they are part of something and that they're not alone in the world. One of the groupings within the LGBT community, transgender individuals have traditionally found themselves feeling a, a bit underrepresented. Do you think there's more work that can be done to make all LGBT individuals feel included in the community? Yeah. Well, um, that's been unfortunately part of the LGBT activist history, is that, you know, it was like, we'll come back and get you later, and that's just unacceptable. And so it is important that we uh, include the trans community, intersex community, those people who, I mean, we just, we, I did an event here at Pimlico School, which is a public school here in London, and a young man, um, uh, I spoke to the school, and this young kid said, you know, I'm going to take this and, and, and do a thing. And one of the questions that was asked for him on LGBT rights, and, and he did it in his school, and he's here today, um, uh, I think he's 14 or 15, and, um, you know, he said, uh, he was asked, are you gay? And he said, I'm not sure. But I know that regardless that we should be moving in this direction and, 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 and teaching about uh, 
you know, not just, L not just gay people, but lesbians, bisexual, transgender, and as a community, everyone should be fighting xenophobia and sexism. And so it's all, there's, these are all interconnected. There's a intersectionality of all of these issues. And so it's important not just to work with our trans brothers and sisters, but to make sure that our Muslim LGBT brothers and sisters and our Jewish LGBT brothers and sisters and our um, Indian LGBT brothers and sisters, people who don't maybe look like mainstream gay community are also included. And finally, Harvey's, one of his most famous speeches was about coming out and the importance of that. What would you say to young people that still feel unable to come out? Well, I mean, everyone's got to make that decision for themselves. This is the kitchen table conversation that we've been talking about. And it's still difficult to this day. But we do work at the Milk Foundation in places where it is illegal to be LGBT, where honor killings still take place. And, um, and so people have to be safe. Um, so my message of coming out is very strong in a place like the United States or the United Kingdom. But my message of coming out is self-acceptance interiorly for your interior world first and to make sure that you're safe. We have had activists that we've worked with around the world that are no longer alive because they've come out. Um, so it, we, you have to be cautious. You know, we don't believe in armchair activism. We believe in actually being on the ground and working with culturally sensitive solutions for that message. So that message is paramount important. You, you must be visible, but you also have to do it safely when we're talking about a global, a global movement. Stuart Milk, thank you for joining me. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of The Hardy Report. To let me know your thoughts or to continue the conversation online, tweet me at Edward T. Hardy using the hashtag The Hardy Report. If you'd like to see more, click the subscribe button to ensure that you're amongst the first to find out when new videos are released. Also, check out my social media links below to be kept up to date on everything to do with The Hardy Report. Until next time. Goodbye. Uh, the White House message on Harvey was that Harvey Milk was an inspiration uh, through his courage and through his um, vision to not only LGBT people but to everyone and the President's message was to across the world that he impacted literally tons of millions of people and so um, it was really much a counter message to Arnold's. Well, Harvey was important, but only to San Francisco. So it was really more than anything, it was that Medal of Freedom and the White House message that um, we then convinced Arnold, with some help with a woman named Maria Shriver, who's his wife, um, to uh, sign the bill and create a, a bank holiday that now every Californian celebrates Harvey Milk Day, May 22nd. Every school teaches about Harvey. So it's by law, you must teach about Harvey Milk the week of May 22nd. Um, and some people say, well, it's only one state, but it's twice the size of Australia, uh, population-wise. One out of every eight Americans lives in California. So for, you know, it's pretty significant that we have um, now a holiday celebrating Harvey and his important message. Do you think Harvey was always political by instinct? Well, he comes from a family that, that was active, and so, um, uh, Morris Milk, who was my grandfather, my great-grandfather, I'm sorry, um, uh, Morris, who was Harvey's grandfather, um, he, you know, he, he told Harvey a story that Harvey told me and my brother. It was interesting, my father didn't tell us the story, but Harvey would be told by his grandfather, you know, don't hide your green hair, they can see it anyway, so embrace that. We, we touched on it a little bit at the start of the interview, but what do you see as Harvey's legacy? Well, his legacy is, is really all the kids that have kitchen table conversations that to this day are uncomfortable. Um, who His story, his message, and those that have come out um, publicly have allowed those conversations to be a little bit easier. But they're never easy. I mean, we see even in the most supportive cities, the most supportive environments, telling, you know, for a kid to tell their parents that they think they're gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender is still difficult. And he wanted them to be embraced. He wanted them to be supported. He, he knew that this was a, a movement that requires vigilance, that it doesn't end one day, and that we're, you know, you know he, he believed that it, this is a constant process. He used to tell me that if everyone, every LGBT person turned purple overnight, we would have no problems. 
because we would be in every church, we'd be in every economic group, we'd be in every culture, um, and we'd be visible. And people would support us because we were known and all the lies and myths and innuendos about us would be gone. But we don't turn purple, and we don't turn pink or, or rainbow colored or whatever. And so this coming out process um, and, you know, and, and acknowledging that you are not part of the majority, that you have a, a lifestyle, a love of, uh, of, 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 of potential uh, partners that is different than the majority is a, is a difficult process to this day. And so I think... It... Hello and welcome to the Hard Report. Today I'm joined by Stuart Milk, LGBT rights activist in his own right. You're the nephew of Harvey Milk, the first openly gay person elected to public office in California. You're the co-founder of the Harvey Milk Foundation and have worked across the world and accepted the Presidential Medal of Freedom on behalf of your uncle. Stuart, thank you for joining me. Great to be here. Let's begin with receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom. How does it feel to have your uncle's legacy honoured like that? There's a backstory to it, so I'll tell you that, you know, that also impacted us creating Harvey Milk Day. Um, we had, uh, uh, the year before, uh, we worked out with the White House, my uncle, to receive the, the Medal of Freedom. Uh, we had passed legislation in California creating a bank holiday for Harvey, and that was vetoed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, so, um, you know, the Terminator. We called him the Governator. Um, he was a Republican, and uh, he, his veto message was that Harvey was important, but important to San Francisco and really nowhere else. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, so in the year between that veto in 2007 and... Uh, um, and the following year, we had not only the Presidential Medal of Freedom awarded to Harvey, but he was inducted into the California Hall of Fame. And the Sean Penn movie, Milk, came out, and uh, Sean won the Academy Award for Best Actor. Um, and we had uh, uh, moved forward on uh, naming uh, some more schools after Harvey that were outside of California. So. Uh, um, as a young kid, and he would be, you know, he would say to us, "Well, I don't have green hair. What are you talking about?" And he would go on to talk about authenticity. And so, uh, of course, he wasn't Morris wasn't talking about gay people, but he was talking about just being who you are and don't hiding that from the world. So he kind of, you know, that was in his blood. Um, there was a uh, department store that uh, Harvey uh, worked in, which was his grandfather's um, milk's department store in Woodmere, New York, where. Uh, Morris would bring communi different communities of faith together. Uh, it was finally burned down because of that activity. So there is this, you know, trajectory that Harvey had. Uh, he, of course, ran for politics both in in, in his high school, Bayshore High School, and he had a um, he went to Albany Teachers College, which is now the State University of New York at Albany, and they did a big celebration for uh, for his recognition. But they brought out all this student writing that he did. So his column was actually shut down in college because he was questioning why ROTCs were on campus and why they're teaching teachers about war. And so his column was shut down and then he reinvented it and came back again. So yeah, he has a trajectory of being outspoken and, and, and uh, you know, both in his family history growing up and also in his uh, history as a young man. What was it like having such an outspoken LGBT rights activist as an uncle at a time when it wasn't acceptable to be gay, let alone be campaigning for LGBT rights? Yeah, it was. It was the best. The best of both. It was the best and worst of times. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as a uh, teenager who was gay myself, um, uh, and you have to realize when Harvey ran for public office, it was illegal to be LGBT when he began running, and it was considered a mental illness by the American Psychiatric and Psychological Association. So, you know, for me as a young kid, um, knowing that I was gay in school, you know, having a, you know, the New York Times have on the cover avowed homosexual, that's the way they would describe uh, Harvey, avowed homosexual runs again. Um, you know, for his campaigns. It was really, you know, it would be the front page and milk is not a common name. So, you know, in school people would be like, you know, are you like your uncle? And uh, so it was uncomfortable for me, but, for, but on a personal level I wouldn't have given that up even then because Harvey was my touchstone to my own authenticity. And you know, he has gone back and went back to San Francisco and told everyone that I was gay, but he never talked about that with me. He only talked about why it was important for me to be authentic 
He would tell me stories like of, of my great grandfather, his grandfather with the green hair. Um, but he would give me, you know, he even gave me a book of Native American traditions. Um, uh, and in the cover, he wrote, You and all your differences is the medicine that will heal the world, even when the world doesn't recognize that. Um, he would call me um, from California when I was in junior high school and say, you know, hey, what happened today that you felt different from everyone? And I'm like, oh my God, you know, that's the last thing I want to think about. But he thought it was exciting. He thought it was great. He said, people don't realize the people who are different are, are the people who are going to move the world forward.